All right. So now for the main event, uh, we were really excited to have Konstantin Mashirakov present. Uh, Konstantin is a solution architect at Klika Tech with strong experience in building embedded and machine learning solutions. He's working closely with the clients. He's responsible for the architecture creation and initiation of new IoT and ML related projects. He also leads the machine learning competency and internal courses in the company. Thank you, Konstantin, for joining us today. Uh, we're really excited to have you present for this tiny email talk. And I'm going to hand over to you now for your presentation. We are at Clica Tech, uh, design and develop end-to-end -end IoT solution. We do design, development, deployment, and uh, we uh, supporting customers in each and every type of IoT applications. Uh, historically, IoT meant embedded and cloud and everything uh, besides uh, between them. So uh, during this time, we were focusing on multi-architecture embedded cloud native uh, serverless applications, the way of every backend and data lakes and API and enterprise integration mobile user UI UX and everything that was connected uh, with IoT. So we have strong experience in uh, embedded device, M uh, devices, MCU, DSP, and so on. We uh, experience in uh, uh, creating the Git based, uh, based solutions in Linux, of course, cloud based uh, uh, dashboards, processing and so on. And of course, UI, every type of UI. We also have uh, multi-cloud expertise. Uh, we are proficient with AWS. We have experience with Azure, Alibaba, Google Cloud Platform, you name it. Uh, we are also AWS consulting partner uh, in uh, IoT competency, IoT core, and other services that are connected with IoT. Uh, of course, now uh, IoT also means that we have a lot of data that needs to be processed, analyzed, and uh, taken for the, the decision making. And to do that, we uh, added uh, big data and AI ML competency to our uh, portfolio. So we are involved in the the next wave of innovations by analyzing patterns and trends in data sets uh, to drive uh, business insights and outcomes. Uh, we have a lot of partners, uh, software, uh, hardware, and even uh, communication. Uh, for example, AWS, Altair, Aero Electronics, Evnet, Develka, Espresso, Flora, Alliance, uh, Infineon, Intel, Lenovo, Multitech, Microsoft Azure, NXP, Nordic Semiconductor, OnLogic, Cocktail, ST, Sci5, Sierra, Syntec, Telefonica, T-Mobile, Technicolor, Verizon, Alibaba Cloud, Vodafone, and Wirepass. And uh, with one of uh, our... Uh, I, today, I will talk about one of our uh, projects uh, that was developed uh, with our partner, Infineon. Uh, this project is connected with uh, industrial predictive maintenance. So uh, before I go to the project introduction, I would like to talk a bit about uh, maintenance uh, and its kinds and uh, how it could be improved and give a business different benefits. So first of all, uh, go to, uh, we go to the maintenance type. Uh, historically, there were uh, several types of maintenance. Uh, the most basic one is uh, reactive maintenance. Uh, it's the type when you wait till uh, the equipment actually breaks, then you go and replace the part that it doesn't work. Uh, it works very well uh, when we are talking about, for example, light bulb, light bulb in your room uh, because there is no uh, damage from not having light for some uh, time. But in industrial settings, it can lead to uh, large uh, losses, monetary losses, uh, and even equipment uh, for the equipment breaking. So, um, uh, to prevent it, we go to the preventive maintenance. Preventive maintenance uh, is performed to uh, uh, based on some maintenance plan. So for example, uh, the manufacturer of the equipment provides the uh, estimated useful life of uh, its parts and uh, the plan for replacement. And uh, during uh, specified periods, uh, Serious uh, people uh, go and replace the spots. 
Uh, this allows to uh, reduce the time uh, of that the quint is not in operations. Uh, it allows you to plan this maintenance, but again, there are several uh, different uh, downsides. For example, if equipment uh, breaks before uh, the planned maintenance, then we have the same downside as with reactive maintenance, but we can also replace the part that would work uh, for some time and that would increase uh, basically costs of operations. And it would be good to uh, know when uh, the equipment will break. Um, for that, uh, uh, a good solution would be to add sensors, add monitoring uh, to uh, the equipment and uh, analyze the data that uh, we receive from these sensors to get insights on uh, when and what could break. Then we can plan our uh, maintenance uh, window and send servicemen to replace uh, the detail or the part uh, only when it is really needed. Uh, the next part, the next step from predictions would be uh, prescriptive maintenance. When the analytics uh, model, uh, the machine learning model, uh, tells us not only when and what parts would break, but also how to fix it. It would uh, prescribe uh, the recipe to servicemen what to do, but uh, I believe that this would require adding uh, uh, additional uh, uh, systems to the, for example, deep learning models, uh, and it's not yet here. After that, I believe that there would also be another type of maintenance, and that would mean no maintenance at all. Uh, you can imagine, for example, uh, something similar to how cloud solutions can heal uh, themselves without any additional uh, uh, service. Uh, probably something will be there in the future, but right now uh, it's not here. Uh, so, uh, we are focusing uh, uh, on predictive maintenance as something that can be implemented right now and right here. And I'll talk now about types of predictive maintenance. There are several uh, approaches that could be taken. Uh, for example, uh, we can uh, try to predict the remaining useful life of uh, detail. So the question would be, how long would it take uh, for a failure to occur? Uh, to create such a model, you would need uh, historical data uh, from sensors uh, along with uh, event labels. For example, when the device breaks, uh, a serviceman should add uh, an entry to a database that would uh, act as a label and would be used when you create the models. As you can imagine, it is not a really simple thing to collect because you will need to uh, deploy the fleet with, along with the sensors, you would need to it to, to operate for it some time, some significant time, because uh, this uh, event's quite rare. Here we uh, have several assumptions. For example, that the remaining useful life can be modeled. And uh, we can only uh, predict uh, one type of failure with a given model. Of course, there can be multi-head models that would use the same backbone and uh, different heads for different uh, types of failure, but it's quite difficult to create. And of course, we need accurate labels. The next possible approach would be to predict failure within a given time window. It is a classification task and it answers the question, will the equipment fail within the next n days or cycles, for example, within the next week or month? Uh, again, you would need uh, historical sensor data and the events labels, so you have the same problems uh, with collecting the data as before. But uh, here we can have multi-class classifications that can be used to predict different types of failure. And well, uh, we will need to collect a lot of data for each potential failure. And uh, the third type, the one that is actually easier to implement it, uh, and that is uh, uh, quite a good fit for anomaly detection is uh, anomaly detection. It answers the question, uh, 
uh, is the current equipment behavior is normal. Uh, to train such a model, you don't need historical sensor data. You don't need uh, events label. You need only historical sensor data, uh, probably with a few possible failures. Uh, so uh, we can create such models under the assumption that it is possible to define uh, what is normal and what is not, uh, because animal's behavior is not always a failure. So uh, for this project, and I will talk about it. We decided to concentrate on animal detection and create infrastructure to collect that even data uh, for further uh, implementing other more powerful uh, predictive maintenance, solution, uh, predictive maintenance uh, models. So we, uh, with Infineon, created a complex hardware and software uh, embedded software and the cloud software uh, that can uh, find anomalies in HVACR, uh, heat ventilation, air conditioning, and uh, refrigerator units that can be installed uh, both on big industrial buildings, but also in, uh, for example, consumer uh, air conditioner units. Uh, the main uh, task would be uh, that it would be possible to retrofit any existing uh, system. So we don't want to throw away uh, an existing solution by a new one. Uh, we would like to support a broad range of sensors because different problems require different sensor set. And we would need uh, near real-time condition monitoring to see what is currently happening with the device and uh, the near real-time uh, anomaly detection, of course. Uh, so. Uh, to do that, uh, Infineon has developed an Infineon Extensive Predictive Maintenance Simulation Kit. It's a board that connects to XMC for a 1,700 uh, development board and can uh, be connected to different satellite boards with uh, all kinds of sensors. For example, it could be current monitoring up to 120 amps uh, for uh, current anomaly detection. It can be vibration and position sensors, uh, airflow and pressure measurement for filters, open closed uh, lead detection for detection, uh, detecting the status of service leads and understanding whether the, the device was tampered with or not. It could be whole speed sensors, uh, sound anomaly detection with microphones, all of it. You can also uh, develop in, at uh, your own uh, satellite board with any type of sensors that you need because uh, there are connectors uh, for SPI, I2C, GPU, and uh, other protocols that you can use. Uh, the good thing here is that it uses Ethernet cables, so it can uh, be installed on uh, quite big units. You can look at this board at this link. Uh, we have developed the embed software for this board. It's based on Amazon Fritos, or just Fritos now. And um, it uh, provides automatic uh, provisioning uh, system and other useful things. Uh, we also have created a cloud architecture, uh, a reference cloud architecture that uh, anyone can deploy using uh, CDK templates in their own cloud after they buy this unit and see the data that go, uh, comes from the unit to, in the nice dashboard. So the data goes uh, over in QT to AWS AT Core, and then it is collected in uh, S3 bucket through the Kinesis data firehose for uh, further. Uh, model development, and it is also analyzed in uh, Kinesis Data Analytics uh, using uh, an uh, anomaly detection algorithm called uh, Robust Random Cut Forest. I will talk about it in a bit. Uh, uh, all the data is also sent to Elasticsearch, uh, now OpenSearch, uh, and can be viewed in the key, nice Kibana dashboard. You will see this in the demo. Uh, so let me talk a bit about the anomaly detection algorithm that is used in Kinesis Data Analytics. I understand that it's not uh, quite a tiny ML related one, but I would like to, you to understand why uh, we have selected uh, and why have we go the way we went uh, with tiny ML. So uh, 
robust random cut forest was introduced by Yuha and Sabipta in 2016. Um, it is a sketch algorithm, meaning that it creates uh, some, represent some internal representation using the actual data uh, that uh, was collected. So it stores the data to uh, provide uh, some information on uh, statistical properties of the data. And it was designed to work on streaming data. Uh, basically, it is an assemble of uh, specially constructed uh, trees, random cut trees, that are designed to uh, maintain the distribution of data with all operations that can be uh, used with this tree, for example, insertion, uh, deletion, and so on. So how does it work? It, uh, so first of all, we uh, need to train the algorithm with some data. So when we add a point, we create a bounding box about, uh, around all the existing point in the tree. And after we have created, we uh, split uh, this bounding box in parts, and we create uh, different uh, branches of, of the tree. So after we do that uh, some uh, predetermined uh, amount of times, uh, we have this tree with bounding box for different data points, and uh, we are ready to go. We are ready to uh, evaluate and uh, get the number score for new data points. How do we do this? we actually create a new data point into the tree. Uh, if uh, the point is close enough to uh, other points, uh, then it won't require a uh, change in the tree, the tree a lot because it's more likely would uh, get into some bounding box that already exists in this tree. But if uh, the point is uh, really far from uh, the existing points, it will require uh, changing as a tree Significantly, significantly, and so it uh, would need to be rearranged. And so uh, the anomaly score for this uh, is calculated uh, using the average collision displacement, uh, uh, which is in fact uh, the mean uh, uh, degree of uh, this rearrangement of uh, all the tree in the ensemble. So. Uh, uh, here we see, see a downside of such, such a model is that we need to actually insert a tree into the model, uh, into the tree, uh, into the forest to get the number score. And so if we want to freeze the model, we would need to copy all uh, the point. We also see that this bounding box that are stored can take quite a lot of uh, uh, memory. Uh, so. This algorithm is not a very good fit for tiny ML solution, but it works really pretty well in the cloud. So uh, after we have implemented and looked at the solution, we understood the uh, cons and pros of the solution. The pros is, of course, ease of deployment. You buy the board, you uh, run a script, you get the infrastructure, you see the data from your board. Uh, it's also a near real-time data visualization and anomaly detection. It takes less than a second to see the actual data in the dashboard. Uh, you can also collect the data for your data sets. Uh, and uh, after that, you can, for example, uh, combine this data with uh, events log from maintenance uh, from service man and create any kind of uh, pre-experience solution. And uh, as uh, the anomaly detection model is stream based one and it can uh, add new points to this to it. Uh, it can also adapt to uh, the changing changing environment of uh, customers infrastructure. Uh, cons here is that infrastructure and data transfer costs a lot. Uh, you would need to have either uh, wired or wireless uh, uh, connection. Uh, and of course, you will need to deploy all this infrastructure, all this uh, anomaly detection data analytics uh, into the cloud. And uh, another problem is that it is necessary to pretend that cloud anomaly detection algorithm. So uh, this 
random cut forest uh, would work only after we have filled all the trees. And if you send data not quite often, apparently, then it would take quite a time, quite a lot of time. So uh, right now, uh, I can answer the questions about this cloud solution. Perfect. Thank, thank you, Constantine. So there is one question here, first of all, and, and this is a super interesting in case. So please, everyone, you know, then now's your chance to, to ask more about this uh, predictive maintenance solution. So the first question, Constantine, is, is the, it's from S. Wang, is this anomaly detection algorithm supervised based or unsupervised based? It is unsupervised based. So uh, it just sorts the data and uh, some data, not all of that. And it, uh, maintains the distribution of the data. And if we get the point that is out of this distribution, then it is an anomaly point. And uh, we detect that. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so we have, we have another question here from Karanpreet Singh. Do you make use of an anomaly? Do you make use of any anomaly data to improve performance of the model? Uh, right now, uh, the model is trained from scratch. So uh, if, uh, each time the user is deployed, is, de uh, is deploying the, uh, the solution. So uh, whatever the data user sends during the, this preheating uh, time would be considered as non-anomaly anomaly data. Uh, after this preheating, uh, uh, the user can uh, uh, see the anomaly score for the new data. Awesome. Awesome, interesting. Uh, and so another question here from Andres Fernando Munoz Herrera. His, his question is how to validate the model. Uh, and here it is a pretty difficult uh, question uh, for anomaly detection models because we don't have the data, the labeled data, which would tell us what is the model, what is anomaly, and what is not. Uh, in fact, it is often uh, quite difficult to understand uh, for uh, people for people uh, what is anomaly. Uh, there are some statistical uh, methods, and I can uh, answer this question on the forums. Uh, but it's uh, quite a complex topic. Awesome. Yeah, it, it makes sense. And then there's a few different ways to look at that. Uh, there's a couple of questions. And this was actually something I thought was interesting, Constantine, but your use case was the interrelation between the cloud and, and you know, of course, you're at the very sensor edge here being TinyML and how you've integrated the two for the solution. So there's a couple of questions here around, um, you know, the, the cloud. Um, so one of them is from Philippe Lejeune. It's a, what's your monthly Amazon bill? <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good question. <laughs> and our uh, okay. monthly Amazon bill is quite large because we have different projects. But uh, for this solution, you would, uh, in the minimal, pay uh, like $50 for the uh, uh, EC2 instance that hosts the anomaly detection model in the data analytics and uh, not very much more for, not much more for everything else. So. Yeah, fears are about this. Okay, makes yeah. Thank, thank you for that question. Uh, I'll, Rick, there's a question from Rick Pandy in, in the group. I'll put it in the Q and A. The question is, do you also do back propagation on the hardware, on the edge? Hardware? Yes, yes. Now, yes, we do that. But I will get to this uh, a bit later. Awesome. So okay, uh, are there any other questions? There's a, there's a few more. It depends if you want. We can go through them quickly or if you want to uh, at the end. Let's uh, move on and then we can address them in, in the end. They will be addressed. Awesome. Thank you. Sure. Of course. So uh, we've seen uh, these uh, problems with the cloud solutions. Uh, it works great, but it could be improved with uh, tiny email. And so we decided to do that. Uh, we have looked at uh, the possible anomaly detection algorithm in the uh, that can be implemented uh, in tiny board for microcontrollers. There are some, for example, it K means it uh, DROCC, uh, D Probust one class classification from Microsoft's uh, Gmail, it cla one class SVM and others. Uh, most of them uh, comes from classic statistic statistics. And uh, so they require to understand how they work. They require to understand uh, how they create uh, this uh, decision boundary and uh, how to prepare your data and process the data so that it would work well uh, 
uh, with this uh, specific data distribution. Uh, you can see the different model uh, treats uh, treat uh, different data distributions uh, in a different way. Uh, for example, some of the models would work with uh, several clusters, several modes of uh, the data distribution, but uh, they won't work, for example, if these uh, modes uh, have uh, different uh, uh, density. Uh, and uh, other models have other restrictions. Uh, that's why we have decided to go with neural networks. Uh, because, uh, first of all, uh, they are more familiar to typical developer, uh, developers. Uh, they are easier to implement right now. Uh, we have a lot of uh, tools to do that. Uh, we have uh, optimized optimizers from uh, different hardware vendors. So uh, this is quite a good thing uh, to do. Uh, and we have uh, decided to use the autoencoder algorithm. Uh, what is it? It's a neural network. It can be a deep or shallow network uh, with a bottle, bottleneck layer in the middle. So uh, basically what this model tries to do is it tries to recreate inputs out it, uh, at its outputs. Uh, when the data goes through this bottleneck layer, it's uh, of course, uh, uh, is compressed uh, and it's a low C compression. So uh, the network is trained to recreate only the data that it's seen, bef seen, uh, seen before. Uh, so uh, any kind of anomalies, any kind, uh, kind of unseen data uh, would uh, be reconstructed poorly. And this reconstruction error is basically can be used for anomaly detection. Uh, so anomaly score is uh, calculated as mean average error uh, between uh, the inputs and the outputs. Quite a simple uh, thing uh, to implement and it works pretty well. Uh, now I will show a demo with the actual hardware and um, you will see how it works on the tiny map. Uh, so here in the low uh, lowest right corner, you see the equipment. It's a air conditioning unit. You can also see data from different uh, sensors, temperature one and so on. You see uh, the current operation mode. I will return to it later. Anomaly score and uh, whether the model is, adapt is adapting right now or not. Right now it, it is not. So uh, now we will introduce the anomaly. We will uh, emulate the exhaust clogging. So we will see uh, uh, some problems with uh, air pressure. And you see that after we have uh, uh, prevented the air from going out, we see quite a big jump in the anomaly score. So it works, it works on the device itself. Okay. Mm. So uh, do you have any questions here about what I have described right now? Uh, there was there, there were some questions remaining from the previous section, but one question I, I think came from this demo here was, are the sensors wireline or wireless? And if they're wireless, what about their synchronization? Z they wired. They are wired, all okay. wired. Yes, because uh, otherwise uh, we would need to add uh, wireless chip on each sensor and it would uh, work less reliably in the industrial settings uh, and of course uh, it would make solution really costly. Uh, okay. Uh, and one uh, other question, Constance. Yeah, sure. Sorry, the, mm -hmm. the, there's another question here uh, that related to the NN approach. So the question is from Karim Preet that does NN approach perform better than robust random cut forest approach? Yes, it uh, works better. Uh, but I will uh, uh, describe why a bit later. But right now uh, we see like much bigger anomaly different difference in the anomaly score uh, for the same anomaly when we use uh, autoencoder uh, versus this robust random cut forest. So okay. uh, it it is harder to understand whether it is anomaly with robust random cut forest, and it's much easier with uh, autoencoder. 
Perfect. And two, two more quick questions on the demo is for this one's from Bing Wang. Is the demo using RNN, so recurrent neural network? Uh, no, no RNN at all, only uh, autoencoder. Okay. And a question on the autoencoder is the autoencoder trained only with data without anomalies? Uh, this uh, uh, training, uh, training data uh, can, uh, has some anomalies in, uh, inside, but not a lot of them. Awesome. So, okay. so you can mix anomalies into your training data. Uh, the data doesn't have to be really pure, uh, but uh, it will still work. Okay. okay. So uh, when we have uh, moved to, to the tiny mail solution, we uh, have lost uh, one important uh, uh, thing from uh, the cloud one. Uh, and it is a constant model fine-tuning and training. And it's really important because there is such a thing as a concept shift, uh, which uh, can occur uh, when the distribution on the data uh, with which uh, the model is actually used is different uh, for some reason from the distribution with which uh, the model was trained. It can be caused by simple selection bias. For example, when you don't collect your data with a lot of rigor and it can also be caused uh, with non stationary environment for example it can be environmental change global heating it can be uh, non-repeatability in manufacturing process which cause uh, sensors to give uh, quite a bit different outputs it can be hardware modifications of the equipment for example uh, replacing an air filter uh, with another type of one and it can be also user behavior changes uh, so uh, it is quite important to uh, uh, retrain, periodically retrain your model with uh, new, newly connected collected data. There are different uh, approaches to do that in the cloud. You can collect the data continuously from your devices and then deploy uh, new models uh, using the OTA process. Uh, you can use uh, something like uh, okay. Uh, model fine tuning right on the device. Uh, federated learning also can be used. And for this type of model fine tuning on the device, there are not a lot of papers, quite a bit, quite a few one. It's a uh, tiny machine learning for conceptive by Desibata, Desibata, Simon, and Manuel Raveri. Uh, Kei Han uh, has published a tiny, uh, tiny TL, reduced memory not parameters for efficient on device learning. It was introduced on new RIPs. And uh, another one is tiny, ML, uh, tiny OL, tiny ML with online learning for on microcontrollers by Ren and How. Uh, How. I hope I uh, pronounced it right. Uh, and we have decided actually to implement this last uh, paper on our tiny mail device to see whether it is possible uh, to uh, fine tune the model right there. Uh, how did we do that? Uh, so uh, your model should be in the TensorFlow like format before you can uh, use uh, this uh, library we have created, HTNN. Uh, uh, you convert it to as, as you usual uh, TensorFlow model to TF Lite model, and then you deploy it uh, to your device in the usual way. Uh, so, for example, uh, uh, you create an H file from with the model, and you link with uh, your code with it with that. Then, uh, during the first boot of uh, the device. Our uh, HTNN model editor can uh, uh, separate the model to uh, the frozen and the trainable parts. The frozen parts part is uh, stored, is continued to be stored uh, in a TF Lite uh, format so that it can be used uh, with TF Lite interpreter. Uh, and it's just a plain TF Lite model. Uh, the second part is uh, trainable uh, layers uh, part. Uh, it is stored in the custom format and it is used uh, by HTML interpreter. It's actually something that we can train using backpropagation. Uh, 
So uh, in the uh, upper, uh, during the device separation, we get the data. We put it through HTNN interpreter. It uh, calls the uh, TF Light interpreter to um, uh, run the data through the model backbone, the frozen model backbone. Then it gets the result and sends the result to uh, through these uh, trainable layers, in, uh, and it gets uh, the actual uh, uh, anomaly score. When we uh, enable the fade link, uh, it would also run uh, backpropagation on this custom uh, trainable layers and store them in the device flash. Uh, so here is the demo of how we can actually how we actually train uh, train the model in the on the device itself. Okay. So you can see we have an anomaly, and now we enable the on device fine tuning. Uh, you will see here that the model adaptation starts and we see st uh, the steady decrease of anomaly score after that. It will get to the same levels uh, that were before we introduced the anomaly. Uh, so uh, Basically, uh, we will see the model to perfectly adapt to new operational and conditions. So, for example, one use case would be uh, when uh, the technician replaces the air filter with a new type, and we would see an anomaly, uh, but we know that it is not an anomalous behavior, so uh, we can retrain uh, the model for this new filter type. Another uh, thing that we can do with that is uh, on device uh, or manufacturing tuning uh, when we want to adapt to uh, the sensor specific the model to the sensor specifics. Uh, okay, I am ready to answer questions about this demo and the previous parts if they are. Any. Yeah, we'll, we'll, absolutely. So we do have a lot of questions here. So we'll try to, to make sure that we get to all of them and all, all the ones that don't just run everyone will be addressed in the forum. So one of the questions uh, about this one, Constantine, is is the edge team and microcontroller dependent? Uh, no, it uses uh, only uh, Eugen uh, library for uh, this uh, by propagation and uh, nothing more. So it, it is written in pure C++, so it can be deployed to any microcontrollers or MPUs or whatever. Cool. Nice. That makes sense. Uh, and also a question about, I believe this demo is, do you fine tune the model with just new normal kind of data? Uh, yes. Currently, yes. OK. Awesome. OK. And the last, I suppose, part of uh, my presentation is uh, another thing that we have. Uh, seen in this uh, experiment and it is a catastrophic forgetting uh, phenomena. So what is it? It's a tendency of a neural network to forget previously learned data uh, and uh, previously learned information when learning new information. So for example, if we have our device that can uh, work in different modes and we retain uh, the model with uh, we retain the model in one specific mode, it would uh, start to work worse, uh, to perform worse on uh, another, in another mode. Uh, so uh, we, uh, there are any, several methods to avoid it. It can be a rehearsal or pseudo rehearsal. Uh, it's when we uh, maintain some uh, samples of the data from different modes on the device. And then we mix uh, them with new data when uh, we fine tune the model. Or a pseudo causal uh, probably uh, it's quite similar, but we don't maintain the, data, the actual data and we uh, you somehow use the information that is stored in the model itself to do that. And then we have orthogonality. It's quite a simple approach when we have different model paths for different modes. And so they, uh, un, uh, the, this path, path for uh, modes that uh, we don't train with are not affected 
during the training. And it's basically what we have implemented here. There are several different methods. Uh, for example, it's uh, weight penalization uh, so that in you learned weights are not too far from the weights that were trained during the initial training. So it would, so the model would work on uh, all kinds of data we used during the training well, and uh, it would adapt to the new data. But uh, basically, uh, we went with orthogonality. And uh, with our approach, doing this is quite simple because we uh, have separated the backbone and the head. And if we know the current model mode, we can just use and uh, fine tune the specific the head for a specific mode. Uh, this is basically the same as if we would have uh, uh, several uh, model heads in the model and uh, the input, but it is much easier to implement. Uh, so we just uh, like juggling with this model heads when we switch the mod, the operational mode. So that's about catastrophic forgetting. And the next steps is uh, with a library, it would be to change the architecture, the, archi the architecture of the library to provide support uh, for any inference engine. Right now we support only TF Live um, interpreter, but uh, there are a lot of tools from different hardware vendors and tiny and uh, uh, tiny mail platforms uh, that would be also uh, great to support. Uh, then we don't currently have uh, quantization support and we would like to add it. Uh, uh, we uh, don't use any hardware specific operations right now, but Eugene, Eugene uh, supports it. And so we would like to also add uh, these operations and uh, we would like to support additional operations. Right now we uh, um, support uh, fine tuning only for fully connected layers. And uh, there are several cases where uh, convolution layers would be also beneficial to have. For example, uh, we can use convolutional autoencoder for anomaly detection, and it work, would work better because uh, it uh, wouldn't rely on uh, the position uh, of the anomaly in the time window data. It would work. Uh... Fantastic. Well, first of all, thank you, Konstantin, for a very, very interesting presentation. Um, and a lot of relevant stuff to uh, the different types of machine learning models deployed at the, at the, at the sensor edge. Uh, so thank you for that. We'll go through the questions thank here as much as, as much as we can. So first question, I think, relates to the first uh, discussion you gave on the Infineon product. Mark, it's from Mark Donaldson. Would you consider using AWS Greengrass versus AWS IoT Core? Is there a pro con for using IoT Core versus Greengrass? Yes, we used the uh, Greengrass. Uh, of course, it would uh, require additional uh, hardware, additional uh, gateway. And in this uh, evaluation software solution, we try to be as cheap as possible with only the hardware we need. Uh, but of course, uh, we also did demos and uh, experiments with the green grass based solutions. We run uh, anomaly detection directly on the green grass core uh, using the ST based uh, board. And we used uh, this convolutional autoencoder uh, algorithm. So yeah, but it's not uh, a tiny email related thing. It's more of HML. OK, awesome. Thanks for that. Yes, we have about 10 questions here, Constantine, which is great. So we'll try to get to as many of them in the, in the time we have left. Um, the next question is from Atanasios uh, Bahumis, which is, which are the, what are the time requirements constraints for the response? I believe this was your demo number one, uh, the question is asking about. Uh, could you repeat this question, right. please? The, the question is, what are the time requirements slash constraints for response in your first demo? Oh, uh, so we see uh, the anomaly in within one second after it happens, I think. Uh, but uh, we don't have uh, any response requirements there because it's just a demonstration solution. And uh, we are talking about the development kit for anomaly detection and it would uh, greatly uh, depend on the actual use case you would like to use this uh, anomaly detection kit with. Cool, thank you. 
so another, next question here is from Jeffrey Urban. It's how does the random cut forest deal with shifts in behavior of the population and its individuals over time? That may not represent a failure risk, but maybe wearing in for a population that started new. And I think Jeff, you all, in the rest of this question, you also put some references to some different types of car engines that were used, you know, already kind of worn in uh, for some kind of you know reliability mm -hmm. benefits. So, um, mm -hmm. if you understand the question, Constantine, about the how the dealing with the random. I, I, I think I would be great. Uh, it would be great to answer this question in form because mm -hmm. I think it's quite a difficult uh, thing to um, discuss. We, okay. Yes. So perfect. Yeah, that, that side question can be put into the into the form and, and it is open for discussion. So thank you for that, Jeff. Um, and I but, that answers it. yeah, exactly. And I guess related to this question, you know, to generalize, you know, how to bootstrap a reliability bathtub curve curve given a new population of equipment, which is a really good consideration, and that can be put into the forum. Um, so the next question we're going to talk to about is the. Uh, uh, is, is it from Emi Hussein Moemi, which is, is it a battery-based system or supplied with power lines? I think that was for you. There we go. It is support. It is supported with power lines because uh, usually uh, this uh, uh, industrial equipment is main powered and we have uh, access to this uh, power. Uh, so yes, we don't have any energy construction uh, constra uh, constraints here. Okay, makes sense. Uh, so next question about the autoencoder. The question is, is the input of the autoencoder a KPI of the signal, like mean, standard deviation, et cetera, or is it the signal itself? Uh, I would say that we right now use mean. Uh, we, we use the time window of means uh, within uh, some predefined interval, for example, one second. We sample it with... I don't remember the exact frequency, uh, frequency then we calculate the means for each uh, part of this time, time uh, window, means and standard devi deviations, and then we give it to the model. Understood. Okay, so I'll try and put these questions together. I think there's three of them, so from some Rick Pandy. So the questions are, if you can have anomalies when you can create, um, then if you have anomalies, then you can create synthetic data and validate the model. Um, it's, it's very difficult to do the validation. So I think the question is, if you have these anomalies, you could create them synthetically to try and validate the model. Um, that's the first question. Uh, so uh, you can also you always use uh, statistical methods. You can try to find the distributions of the distribution of the data and create some data out of this distribution. That would be a great synthetical test for an anomaly detection model. But to do that, you would need to really understand the distribution of your data. It's not always a simple thing to do, especially if you have multiple modes with multiple with different densities. Mm -hmm. Makes yeah, absolutely. So that, that's what trying to capture statistical properties of the data. The next question is: um, Is this deployment possible with embed OS? Uh, yes, uh, it uh, is possible uh, uh, whenever you have access to TensorFlow Lite and C++ in your device. It doesn't depend on OS at all. Yep. Okay, I think you mentioned that. And then the uh, relation to that, you know, but so the, the C++ C++ library you just mentioned, um, it has support for custom layers designed using TensorFlow and TF Lite models? Uh, right now, no. Right now we uh, support only fully connected layers. Usually that is enough uh, for most applications because uh, the heads of the models are usually fully connected. Uh, you have uh, different types of layer in the backbones and we don't touch it. So if you want to uh, support such, such models, you will. But uh, as I already said, there are different use cases where you would prefer, for example, use uh, using convolution autoencoder and this, right. and this would require different types of uh, layers in the head. And this is what we would like to add next to the library. Totally, totally, that'd be a great addition. Um, so uh, two more questions here we have in the Q&A. And if you have something in the chat, please put it in the Q&A so we can bring it up and put it in the forum. We'll try to get to as much as possible. Question is from Steven Hernandez. It's, could you repeat the name of the C++ library that was used for backprop? Was it open source? Uh, Eugen. Uh, could you, could you type that, just spell it out for me quickly? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'll try it. Okay, yeah, perfect. So that way we can, we can have that here for everyone. That's a great question and it's pretty cool. Uh -huh. that yeah, uh, I suppose I have some problems with accessing the chat. So could you please add, uh, uh, add this question to the forum sure. and I will. Sure, sure. <laughs> no problem, that's, that's great. Okay, we'll do, we'll do another question here from Anton Seberg, which is, did you have any issues with limited RAM on the MCU? That's a great question. Uh, 
Uh, no, basically this uh, is a very small model. Uh, it took about you know, 10 kilobytes of RAM and uh, several kilobytes of uh, several uh, dozens of kilobytes of flash. So we had enough resources to do that. Okay, awesome. And we'll do one more question here that I see from Ahmed, which is about the backprop again. So how is the backpropagation implemented in terms of memory footprint, data transfer, data types? And how about when you're switching from one device to another, is your schema being optimized accordingly? You know, fine tuning of quantized models, et cetera. Um, so this is, yeah, that's the question. Um, okay. Uh, so uh, about the, I cannot uh, really answer about the RAM requirements for backpropagation. It's about the same as with uh, forward pass. So it don't require more than couple of kilobytes of RAM, uh, but I need to check that. And I'm not really sure that I understood uh, the question about different types of device. Uh, could you please explain it in a bit de in more details? Sure. Uh, I, can, I can try to add here, this will be the last question we address. So it's when you're switching from one device to another, are you optimizing your, your training scheme accordingly? You know, are you fine tuning the you know, models if they're quantized? I don't think you're doing quantization yet. You mentioned that that was- We don't period. have, we don't have quantization yet. We yep. only have. So uh, this is here where we'll, we'll stop. Thank you again, everyone, uh, Constantine. That was a fantastic presentation. Love the demos and awesome, awesome everyone for you know, all your questions. That really was super engaging and we can keep this going online. Thank you. Thank everyone you. For